Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, as I mentioned last week, if you remember, if you were here, this is an exciting week for the kids. I mean, very rarely do they get an entire week out of school for Thanksgiving. And so they hit the ground running on, on Friday afternoon, and they are excited, and they're free, and they're having fun. And that is, you know, emblematic of our attitudes at this time. I mean, the holidays are here. Thanksgiving gives way to Christmas, and it doesn't stop. In fact, I think we went from Halloween to Christmas in the malls. we got to skip Thanksgiving all together. But it's an exciting time where families and friends gather together around the table, and they celebrate what it means to be a family. But the sad reality is that hundreds of thousands of people will gather around their dining room tables this Thursday, and they will feast but they'll fail to stop and recognize the one for whom we should give thanks. They'll forget to turn their voices to heaven and thank God. That should not be true for us. We are those who have received a great heritage. I mean, of all the people of the world, the citizens of the United States of America should reflect on our own history and realize we have so much to be thankful for. And you heard the proclamation from George Washington. Congress together said, let's thank our creator. Let's thank the one who's made this possible. There's so many people who've lost that. You know, our history as Americans is a rich and a long history. And while we may think we've been a major player in the world for a long time, the reality is that compared to the rest of the world, we're really kind of the new kids on the block. Still. And we have a couple hundred years and a handful of wars, but we're going to hear in our text today about Palestine. They've been fighting the same kind of wars for 5,000 years. We have much to reflect on as a people. I mean, think about it. The Reformation that began the transformation of the church in the early 1500s. Martin Luther and Albert Zwingli that began the Reformation. Columbus had just discovered America. They knew about the new continent, but they had their minds focused elsewhere, really paying attention to it. We have a long and rich history as a nation. And our nation is one that was founded on the principles of freedom and equality for every human being with God as our witness. And because we have been those who have taken a stand for, for what is good and against what is evil, we have been blessed as a nation. But I fear we're coming to the point where we have forgotten where we've come from. And so this morning as we look at our text... I want us to think of it in the context of who we are as a people of God in relation to what we see in the text and make sure that we always recognize the one to whom we should place our trust and confidence. You know, our text is the story of Gideon. And it's, it's the age-old struggle of Abraham's children. Now, if you look today in the, in the world, Israel is always fighting the Arabs around them. And Israel has been fighting for its independence, trying to reclaim land that they believe is historically their possession. And they have reclaimed ground at the cost of many lives over a long period of time. They want to take what belongs to the Arabs. Well, if you flip that around, you have exactly what's happening in our text. The Arabs have come in and have taken what belongs to Israel. And yet it happened you know, 3,000 years, not 2,000 years, before Christ came. You've got the period of the judges where Midian has taken over Israel, over Palestine, and is holding them in subjugation to them. Now, the reason for it, you see, the very first passage in Judges 6, where we're going today, says, And Israel sinned in the sight of God. So God gave them over into the hand of the Midianites. See, God had blessed the people of Israel. They'd come out of Egypt. They'd taken possession of the land. They were living in peace. But there was a problem. 
They kept turning away from their God to turn to the pagan gods of the nations around them and worshiping the false gods. And so because they turned away from the one true God, their God, and worshiped the false gods, God was using the Midianites as an instrument of judgment on their sin to call them to repentance. And the Midianites, who had conquered Israel, had come up with an ingenious way to keep them in bondage. You see, every spring they would plant the crops. And every fall when the crops came to har came harvest time, when the crops were ready to be harvested, instead of letting the Israelites harvest the crops, the Midianites would ride in mass force and take all the harvest. They would take every newborn lamb, every newborn calf. They left the nation destitute for food. And this went on year after year so that the, that the children of God, the people of Israel, were literally hungry all the time, searching for food, because every time they found some, it was taken away from them. They kept them in bondage. And it had gone on so long that God had finally come to the point that he was going to restore his favor upon Israel. And that's where we come to our text. You see, Gideon is hiding in a wine press, threshing grain. He climbs inside a wine press to, to, to prepare the grain to eat, not where you would normally do it, because he's hiding from the Midianites, lest they come and take the grain he's trying to get ready for his family. And God comes to Gideon and tells Gideon, You are a valiant warrior. He's a man in hiding. And yet, the angel of the Lord comes and says, you are a valiant warrior. Gideon doesn't know what to think of that kind of greeting. And so he, he turns to the angel of the Lord and says, why? Why is God letting this happen? Why are we suffering as a people? The angel of the Lord doesn't answer the why. God never answers why. Instead, he tells Gideon what he's supposed to do in service to God. Now, Gideon's not sure who this is. And he's a little bit freaked out by what's going on, honestly. And so he implores the angel of the Lord, please stay here and let me prepare a sacrifice. I implore you. And the angel of the Lord says, okay, I'll stay right here. You go prepare the sacrifice and bring it. And Gideon runs and he prepares some unleavened bread and a roasted lamb and, and, and the broth, and he brings it to the angel of the Lord, and he says, set it there on that rock. Pour the broth over it. So Gideon sets the bread and the meat and pours the broth over it. And the angel of the Lord takes the staff in his hand and reaches out and touches the rock, and the rock catches fire and consumes the offering there before Gideon's eyes. And the angel of the Lord vanishes, and Gideon all of a sudden realizes this wasn't just an angel. This was God who had come to visit him. And immediately he fears he will be struck dead because he has stood face to face with God. But the Lord assures him by telling him, you will not die, but you will go forth in my strength and you will deliver my people. And here's what I want you to do. You will go tear down the pagan altars that your people have set up. You see, they turn to the worship of the two gods in the region around them called Baal and the Shira. Doesn't mean anything to you, other than the fact that these two gods were fertility gods. They wanted the gods of Baal and Asherah to bless their crops and bless their, their, their livestock. And the way you worship these gods is by a lot of perverted and moral sex in their name. So God tells Gideon, you go tear those altars down. Destroy them. Burn them. And Gideon doesn't. But he's scared. Remember he was hiding in the wine press. He's scared to do it in the daylight. Lest others see him. So he goes at night and tears him down. And burns him like God told him. But he does it at night because he's scared. And the Lord comes and says Gideon you go. And, and bring my people together. And go and deliver Israel from the hand of the Midianites. And Gideon is scared. He's not Sure. And so that's where you have the text you heard. Lord, I want, to, I want to put a test out. 
I just want to be sure that I'm the one you really want to lead Israel. I'm going to put the fleece out on the threshing floor, and in the morning, make the fleece wet and the ground dry. He gets up in the morning, and the fleece is so wet, it rings out a bowl of water, and the ground all around is brown and dry. And that's not enough. Lord, let me one more time. Please don't be angry with me. Put it out one more time. And this time, let the fleece be dry and all the ground around it be wet. And the next morning, the ground around it is soaking wet like mud. And the fleece is bone dry. And that miracle, those two miracles, told Gideon two things. One, that it was God who was going to deliver his people out of bondage to the Midianites. And two, Gideon was the one he chose to be their deliverer. That God was going to use Gideon to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Midianites. But what should that story teach us? Do you ever doubt? Do you ever question? Do you ever confused with why God does the things He does? That God would have patience with a doubting man and allow him to put God to the test what does that say for us who so often doubt and fail to trust in what God calls us to do? God has patience with you because God has a plan for Gideon's life. Gideon is to go and rally all the forces of Israel and set Israel free from many nights. And he sends out word to all the tribes and he rallies 32,000 soldiers of Israel. But there's a problem. The Midianites have rallied their forces because they hear what's going on and they enter the land with 132,000 soldiers. 132,000 Midianite soldiers against 32,000 Israelites. And you know what God says? Gideon has too many. For when they set themselves, when I deliver them from Midian, they will believe that they have done it by their own hand and they won't honor me. So you go and tell all of your soldiers, anyone who, has, who is fearful and trembling, go home. You don't have to fight. So out of his 32,000 soldiers, 22,000 go home. And Gideon is left with 10,000 men to face an army of 132,000. You know what God says? Gideon, that's still too many. That's still too many. They will believe they've delivered themselves. So I'll tell you what. Take your army down to the river. Let them get a drink of water. And I will make a division there. And so basically all these soldiers go down to the river. And it's basically those who belly up to the river. Lay down on the ground and drink. Versus those who kneel down and scoop up the water with their hand. And when the division is made. Gideon has 300 soldiers. The rest are home. God sends them home. 300 soldiers against 132,000 in the opposing army. Ridiculously outnumbered, unable. I mean, who in their right mind would, would face those kind of odds? And yet God says, Gideon, it's just right. This is how it And God lays out the battle plan. Now they're about to face the men in that army with swords and spears and shields and helmets and horses and chariots and all the implements of war. And God tells Gideon, here's what you are to take. Each of your 300 men shall have a bugle, a clay pot, and a torch. And go to war. You see, God never does it the way we think. He does it his way. And he reveals his power. The Midianite army is camped in the valley, and Gideon is told to take his 300 men and divide them into three companies of 100. And in the middle of the night, right after the watch is set, in the wee hours of the morning when the change in the guard takes place, when everyone is asleep, Gideon is to sound his trumpet. And all of his 300 from three different sides of the valley sound their trumpets. And they take those clay pots and they break them on the, on the rocks. And the sound of the breaking clay pots echoes through the valley. And they wave their torches and scream. And as that happens, the Midianites awaken to the rumbling thor of the clashing pots. And they see the torches and the yells of victory. And it says God confused them and threw them into turmoil. 
well. And in such a panic to flee the oncoming army of 300 men, they slaughter themselves trying to escape. And Gideon calls for the rest of Israel to join him. And by the end of the day, 122,000 Midianites lay dead. And Israel said, Israel set free, and that freedom and peace last for 40 years, for the entire lifetime of Gideon. And when Gideon dies, after 40 years of ruling as judge with peace in the land, you know what happened? The text says, and Israel again sinned and decided their God. And God brought in another oppressor. So often we fail to realize the blessings we have when our focus and our attention is turned upon God. You look at the world around us, and America is by all standards the greatest nation in the world. Our lowest economic status of an American is higher than the vast majority of the rest of the world. We are blessed beyond measure, and yet most of the time we look to God and say, God, why? Why is there somebody that's sick? Why is there disease? Why do children die? Why is there a war? We're always complaining. We're never thankful. We're always complaining. And you know what? God never answers the why. Never. You won't find it in the Bible. He never answers the why. You know why? Because the moment you turn to God and say, why? Why is someone sick, God? Or why is my life like this, God? The moment you turn to God and say, why, you're saying, God, it's your fault. You did this to me. When you ask why, you're accusing God. You want to know something? It's not God's fault. It's not God's fault. Why do you think the children of Israel and, and you know, the descendants of Abraham, the, the Jews, are fighting the Arabs and it's been going over 5,000 years? Because in their hearts there is hatred and prejudice toward each other. They are sinful human beings, and that's why they keep fighting with each other. The same is true for us. We have just as much racism and prejudice in our community here as they have in Jerusalem. Why? Because we are sinful human beings. Why do people get sick and die? Because sin in this world is constant. Why are people living in poverty? Because sinful people refuse to share what they have in abundance with those who have need. What are the problems in the world? They all result from sin. And sin is not God's fault. He didn't plan and make sin happen. Sin is our fault. And we're responsible. So when we turn to God and say, why, we're asking the wrong question because he looks back at us and says, why not? God never answers the why, but he always gives the how. How do I fix this problem? You know, there's a story told of a, of a young girl who got a brand new car. And it was a little sports car. And she was running fast on the Zipping in and out of the lanes around the traffic, just flying by everybody. She was having fun until she came upon a turn that she couldn't quite handle. And she took that little car and ran it up into the side of the embankment of the bridge and just tore the whole side of the car off and spun it around and wrecked it into pieces. All the people who, had who she had passed came up in the accident and they stopped and helping her out and she's crying. You know, why God, why did you do this to me? And one of the men standing there says, Young lady, God didn't do this to you. You did it to yourself. You're driving too fast. We always want to blame someone else instead of looking at ourselves. What does God do for you? He doesn't answer the why, but He shows the how. What does God do for you? How has He chosen to remedy sin and its consequences in your life? I mean, be honest with yourself. Can you escape the judgment you deserve? Can you, yourself, avoid the guilt that is rightfully yours? Can you keep death from taking hold? I think if we're honest with ourselves, 
on all of those, the answer is no. And we can turn to God and say, why do I have to go through this? And God is going to look at you and say, because you are a sinful human being, and that's what sin does. Sin has consequences. I don't answer the why, but I'll show you the how. How does God choose to get victory over what we suffer from? By overcoming <coughs> impossible odds. Gideon faced three 132,000 soldiers with 300 men. Impossible odds. Is it possible for you to overcome Satan and hell and judgment from God for all eternity? It is absolutely impossible. But what is impossible for you is possible for God. And He chose to save us in a way that didn't make any sense at the time. For a lot of people, it doesn't make any sense. Gideon found himself standing before God, telling him how the victory was going to be won. God chose to come here and show us in person how the victory was going to be won. The victory over an enemy we could never defeat on our own. When Jesus went to the cross. There, at the cross, God was able to defeat our enemies. Not in a way that made sense. But God's ways often don't make sense by human standards. Because God's ways are not our ways. There at the cross, the judgment that we could never overcome, He took on Himself so you would never stand in judgment before others. The guilt that is rightfully yours as a sinful human being became His guilt so that God the Father could look at you and say, You are now holy. In my son. And death that you cannot escape, he took to himself and died so that he could give to you new life, in fact, eternal life, something that you could never obtain on your own. Jesus has won for us the victory over our enemies, complete and total, and he gives it to you as a gift. And so when you sit around your Thanksgiving table giving thanks for a table full of food, which is right and proper to do, realize that the God who has blessed you in this life is the God who has promised to bless you in the life to come. And with thankful hearts, reflect all that He has done for you to the world around you. What is the answer for our world? What is the answer? For our nation? What is the answer for our community where sin and, and hatred and you know all kinds of things go on to destroy people's lives? What is the answer to sin? <coughs> Jesus. And the only way our world is going to change <coughs> is when you begin to reflect who God is in your life. So he can touch the lives of those people around you that don't know him. You know, the story is told, uh, who was it this morning came in? Tommy came in and said he'd been to a Gideon meeting. And the Gideons are, are famous for handing out Bibles. And not just in our country. I, mean, I got one in like second grade you know, years ago. The Gideons would come and get Bibles out of schools and hotels and, and all around the world. They give, they give millions of copies of the Bible. And there's a little girl in Columbia who, who was given a Bible in her second grade class. The New Testament in Spanish. And she... She was reading the Bible when her father came in. And he picked it up and looked at it and said, Don't read this trash. It's full of lies and fables and myths, and you're better off not to read it. And he threw it down. And she picked it up. And while he was at work, she'd read it. And she'd read through it while he was gone and kind of hide it when he was home. And one day he came home unexpected and walked in on her reading her New Testament. And he angrily snatched it out of her hands and stuck it in his coat. The next day, he went off to work. He was a miner. And in the middle of the day, the sirens went off. There had been a cave-in in the mine, and this little girl's father and 30 other men were trapped in the low ground. It took five days for the rescuers to dig them out. When they finally made it to the men, every one of them had died. And there they found the little girl's father dead, but holding that little New Testament in his hands. 
when the rescue workers took the New Testament out of his hand, they opened it up, and there written on the inside cover of pages, it said, to my little girl, keep reading this book. It will make all the difference in your life. I will see you in heaven. And when they turned to the back of the little Gideon New Testament, there was the sinner's prayer, and there on the signature line, the father had signed his name below the sinner's prayer. But to their surprise, when they turned to the next page, there were the names of the other 30 miners who were trapped in the mine. You see, God is able to say, we don't understand how or why or when, but God is able to overcome enormous odds to bless His people. He will use you as you reflect Him to change our world, to change our community, to literally save those who are lost. And so as you gather this Thanksgiving with thankful hearts, your praise to your God. And with thankful hearts, live your lives knowing that He will use you to change eternity for those who are And now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the life of the last part of the